Good morning and welcome to our 174th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you've joined us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way this call works is this is an AMA, meaning ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, personal questions, career questions, and my goal is to humbly help you take your career or business to the next level. I'll do my best. Uh, now this call lasts two hours, uh, and then at 10 a.m. Pacific time when the call ends, I have an MBA office hours for only silver students. Uh, that lasts one hour in case my students wanna use Zoom or ask me any other, any other questions. I can go through your LinkedIn profile, uh, help you with a business plan, et cetera. Now, to learn more about uh, the, 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 the silver um, version of my MBA program, um, you can go to my website, haroonventures.com. And up here, you can just select uh, my MBA degree program, which will take you to uh, my, my school here online. And so there's a 30 day, 100% money back guarantee uh, there's close to 400 hours of core content now. Um, so check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and I teach you all the concepts that they don't teach you in business school that they actually should. Like how to interview, how to network, how to present, um, how to find customers, um, how to manage your own money. I found that when I did my MBA at, at Columbia Business School many decades ago, um, myself and all my friends that went to other decent business schools like Harvard, Wharton, etc., when we graduated, we didn't know how to manage our own money, but we learned how to manage other people's money. And all those aforementioned topics, like how to present, uh, how to interview, that sort of thing, are not taught in business school, which is a little bit out there, which is why I do what I do. All right, um, let me first of all kick it off with a quick discussion uh, on, uh, on, on Elon Musk. So we all know the atrocities that are going on right now uh, in the Ukraine. And when one country attacks another, what they try to do is they try to knock out all the communications. Um, so you can't get any internet, uh, phone access, etc. And the reason the internet was created by the US government back in the late 1960s was just in case, God forbid, um, the Soviets hit the middle of the US with, with a, a nuclear bomb, it's terrible. And what could happen is the East Coast would still be able to talk to the West Coast of the United States through the internet because you can't just block one connection, you can, or you can block one connection, but not all in a country. That's why they call it the World Wide Web. And so what Elon Musk has done uh, with, the, with Ukraine is, is wonderful. He took his Starlink subsidiary, which is part of SpaceX, which I think he's gonna spin off into a publicly traded company soon. He took his Starlink subsidiary and he moved a bunch of the satellites that he has as part of Starlink over top of the Ukraine so that uh, the Ukrainian government, military, et cetera, uh, and people there uh, can access free internet uh, from the sky, which is a beautiful thing. And God bless you, Elon Musk, for doing this. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about is, is there's a quote from Salvador Dali, which is, if you strive for perfection, you'll never reach it. And that's been one of my many problems in business is I try to be a perfectionist. But if you try to be a perfectionist with your product, then you're going to miss the market entirely. And Reid Hoffman, who's the wonderful co-founder of LinkedIn, also said, if you, release, if you re release your product when it's 100% ready, it's too late. And so there's this concept of an MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product, that venture capitalists talk about. And what that means is get your product out to the marketplace to at least test it, even when it's not 100% ready. And I remember when I used to be a programmer years ago, uh, I was really excited about creating an amazing graphical user interface with nice connectivity to database, et cetera. And I found that the last 5% of that project that I worked on when I was a coder was getting rid of all the bells and whistles and just making sure the darn thing worked. And so when it comes to an, a minimum viable product, probably the best example I can discuss with you um, is, is a company called Nest. So what happened was there's this company called Nest that Kleiner Perkins, a big venture capital firm, invested in. And what happened was uh, Kleiner Perkins made a couple billion dollars from selling that company to Google. And Nest is the company that makes those thermostat air conditioner systems in your house that are Wi-Fi based. And so I invested with uh, Kleiner Perkins uh, in a couple of deals in the past when I worked at VC. And when I was at Kleiner Perkins headquarters on Sand Hill Road, I talked to the partner that worked on that deal. His name is Randy Komisar. Really nice guy, really smart. And I said to Randy, I, I said, Randy, how did you know 
this Nest uh, investment was going to make you billions and do extraordinarily well? You know, what kind of a product did they have? Did it work really well when you first saw it? And he said, no. All they did was they brought a piece of wood that looks kind of like this, and they explained how it was going to work. And so I said to, I said to him, I said, that's amazing, but how did you know to invest? And he said, because the engineers and the management team were so passionate and so convincing uh, that um, I decided to take a chance on them. And so your delivery is incredibly important when it comes to selling yourself in terms of getting a promotion, a raise, or selling your business model to be able to raise capital. And so, as Maya Angelou once said, people might not remember exactly what you said, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. And so in my MBA program, in the third semester, which you can start right now, just go to haroonventures.com to check it out. But in the third of four semesters, I have what's called a venture capital boot camp. And this VC boot camp is based on my years of experience as a venture capitalist. Uh, I humbly had my own firm that invested in, in Facebook years before the IPO. I also invested in Palantir, et cetera. Um, I also guest lectured a lot at Stanford. Uh, I went to Stanford to uh, give uh, advice on business models uh, for students. And I mentored tons of students as part of their core curriculum. I also worked uh, alongside uh, 500 startups by investing uh, in companies uh, that they had, they had founded, which is a great incubator. And I take all that experience I have, all my successes and many failures, and I put that into part of my MBA degree program as part of a venture capital boot camp, so I can humbly help you work smarter and not harder to start a company with no money. That's right. I don't want you to raise money from a bank. I want you to raise money from high net worth investors. And to learn much more about how to raise money from high net worth investors, and I'm humbled to say I've raised and managed over a billion dollars in my career, what you can do is you can go to my, my website here. Let's go back a page here, haroonventures.com, and scroll down and download this book called Networking to Get Customers a Job or Anything You Want. It's, it's a free download, and I humbly hope it helps you a lot in terms of raising money. Uh, if it doesn't, and if you're having problems with your startup, uh, then please let me know so I can humbly help you here on this weekly webcast through YouTube chat or during the MBA office hours uh, starting at 10 a.m. today where I can do a Zoom call with you, look over your business plan, um, help to fix your LinkedIn profile, etc. Thank you. All right. One more topic I want to I talk about before we get started here uh, is Microsoft and Amazon. Why is it that Microsoft and Amazon are so successful, yet there's not that many startups that come out of Amazon or Microsoft. It doesn't seem to make sense. You know, why do more startups come out of the state of California? Well, the reason is, in the state of California, unlike almost every other state in the country, non-compete contracts are ignored by the courts. What does that mean? Well, if you work at Cisco, ticker CSCO, and it's a big networking company, and you leave, to go to work at Juniper the next day. Regardless of what contract you sign with Cisco, you can still go work there. And then you can come back from Juniper, their competitor, ticker JNPR, a couple days later to Cisco if you want to. And so you get this friction-free flow of labor, uh, which helps uh, the state of California a lot when it comes to startups. Now, if we compare and contrast this uh, with Washington State, which is in the Pacific Northwest, where you have uh, the headquarters of Amazon and Microsoft, you can't do that. And so what happens, and I have friends that work at both Amazon and Microsoft that tell me this, it's fascinating. But if you leave Amazon and you're an engineer in the state of Washington and you go to Microsoft, you're not allowed to be an engineer there for a year usually. So you end up going as an engineer from Amazon to the finance department at Microsoft. And then after a year, you'll switch over to be an engineer at Microsoft. And the same thing works if you go from Microsoft to Amazon. And so you don't have the free flow of labor uh, in many states and many countries uh, in the world. Uh, and that really hurts innovation because you feel like you're trapped in a company and you can't leave. Now, the interesting thing about, um, about the, the, the go-go 90s we had globally, uh, where the economies were doing extraordinarily well in almost every major market, 
The interesting thing was it wasn't because of the growth of technology. And so Dr. Alan Greenspan, who was the Federal Reserve uh, chairperson at the time of the United States, the person in charge of interest rates, he guest lectured when I worked at Citadel, uh, a big hedge fund. And he explained to us that the reason why we had unprecedented economic growth back in the 1990s was because the Berlin Wall fell. And when the Berlin Wall fell, you had all of this unbelievable, uh, uh, intelligent uh, Eastern European labor moving west that was much cheaper. And so that kept prices uh, in check. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a wonderful thing, the free flow of labor. Uh, I think it helps uh, companies to thrive uh, from an innovation perspective. Thank you. Okay. All right. Give me one second to get, get to your questions. Looks like somebody just posted the same question um, over and over and over again. Uh, please just post questions once if, if that's okay. Thanks. I will get to your question. I promise you. Okay. So first up, I, I, I see here. Uh, Alex, Alex, good morning. Uh, Alex wrote, uh, do you think uh, in job interviews, a person who is really passionate and has mediocre answers or the person who has great answers and minimal enthusiasm, which one gets the job? Yeah, it's, it's a tough call right there. Um, I would say that less is more. Less is more. Keep your answers very short. And in my MBA degree program, I teach you how to get any job uh, I also teach you how to bring many templates to interviews to impress and help your interviewer uh, either uh, uh, make more money, get promoted faster, or in job, enjoy their job more so. And so there's a technique to that. And I've, I've humbly switched careers many, many times. And I have over 100,000 students that have taken my job courses that have changed careers as well. And please check it out uh, on my website, haroonventures.com. But generally speaking, I think that enthusiasm is crucial because again, as Maya Angelou said, people might not remember what you said, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. And so a great entrepreneur and a CEO, they all have one thing in common. She or he can sell and they can sell themselves. And if you can't sell yourself with enthusiasm, then you can't sell it all. And I teach you all of these lessons and much, much more. Uh, in my MBA degree program. And thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Okay, next up we've got Andre. How are you, Andre? Andre's in my MBA program who wrote, good morning, uh, everyone, and Chris, hi. Uh, how do you define a great manager? Yeah, and then also, can you get, you can refer any books on management styles? Yeah, absolutely. So a great manager is one that can motivate employees. It's one that can also listen also, uh, it can, it can um, um, take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And they're incredibly unemotional. And if you think about the most successful entrepreneurs and managers and CEOs in history, they're great salespeople, but they're also unemotional. And as, as Warren Buffett once said, the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff and it goes on sale. Imagine that, selling a stock or something you like because it's cheaper. So you have to be very, very unemotional as a manager as well. And a great example of this uh, is Elon Musk. So Elon Musk is unemotional. And I think that's a beautiful thing. He could turn it on and be emotional when he wants to. But he's unemotional a lot of time when he invests, when he tweets, when he manages, and when he changes the world. And so Elon Musk, back in March of 2020, when the market was at the low, he backed up the truck and he bought a lot of shares in Tesla. He bought at the bottom. Everybody else was freaking out at that point in time. And that's when you gotta buy always. You know, you gotta be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And then he turned around and sold a bunch of shares in Tesla last year. Tesla is down, now down 40% uh, since the peak uh, uh, last year and we're officially in, in a market correction. So the bottom line is great managers can motivate, they can listen, and they're unemotional as well. And I have a course coming out very, very soon, uh, and I'm partnering with uh, Jimmy Narain, uh, a friend of mine who also teaches on Udemy. Uh, the course is gonna be called the Complete Leadership Course, and that will be out by April at the latest. Okay. In terms of books, um, I can't really think of any great books uh, on management. 
Um, what I like to do instead is I like to listen to biographies or autobiographies of successful business people um, and just kind of hear what their lessons are. You know, for example, uh, Jack Welch, he wrote a book called Straight from the Gut that he published in 2001 that I devoured. And Jack Welch uh, was the, uh, the CEO of General Electric. Uh, so you can get some good management tips there as well. You can also listen to the audiobook uh, version uh, of a win The Winner's Dream, which is a book that was written by Bill McDermott, um, who was the former CEO of, uh, of SAP, and now he's a CEO of, of ServiceNow, ticker NOW. And I think this guy can sell better than anybody I've ever met. I've met him a number of times. He's gregarious. Um, he's, he's, he's charming. He's a good, good dude. He remembers everyone's name. Uh, and I think he should run for president. So, Bill, if you're listening, I would, I would vote for you. Okay. Bill McDermott, that is. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Calipita wrote, uh, that's awesome to see um, how you've grown here on, on YouTube. Thank you. It's, it's because of my, my wonderful students. Um, my, my students inspire me so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and then you wrote here, uh, I keep my fingers crossed for you. Greetings uh, from Poland. Thank you very much. And speaking of Poland, uh, Jimmy Narain, um, who I'm making that leadership course with, uh, he lives in Poland. He's from Poland as well. He's a great guy. Um, he is uh, one of the global thought leaders uh, on, on how, to, how to be confident and how to present as well. Really, really good guy. And I partnered with him before on a course on networking about five years ago. Yeah. And I want somebody to make a movie about Lech Walesa because he's, he's one of my, my heroes. All right. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Jacques wrote, uh, greetings uh, from South Africa. Great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, and I just finished Trevor Noah's uh, audio book. It's eight hours long. Uh, he grew up, of course, uh, in South Africa. Um, really funny guy. Yeah. And the book I'm listening to uh, uh, right now is actually by Will Smith. Um, and it's called Will. Just W-I-L-L. -L. It's 14 hours long, the audio book. And it's amazing. And oh my God, Will Smith is so passionate. And I feel so inspired every time I listen to that book. Another book, if you want uh, to, to listen to it, which is about geopolitics and the Ukraine and Russia is a New York Times best-selling book I finished last year uh, called This is How They Tell Us the World Ends. It, it's not negative like that, but it talks about in the book Russian espionage uh, when it comes to um, hacking Ukrainian computer systems. Yeah. Okay, moving on to uh, Majed who wrote, uh, Hi, Chris. Uh, this message will be split into two parts. Sure. Uh, as a result, please read this message and the next one together. First, I was one of the top three participants who asked questions in each of the last three weeks. Thank you. Uh, second, I hope you had a lovely start to your day. Uh, I always do. Thank you. And whenever I get up, the first thing I do is I thank God for 10 things. Because when you practice gratitude, you're in a peak mental state. And so those 10 things are always this. My kids... Andrew, Matthew, Dylan, my mom, my dad, my brother, Jamie, my sisters, Katie and Elizabeth, uh, my wife, who comes first, sorry, because MBA does not stand for Mary, but available. I can't retract that, can I? Just kidding. Um, and the last one, of course, is uh, my students, all of you. Thank you. Okay. So the question is, I passed my CFA level one exam, but I don't think uh, becoming a CFA is my life calling. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with the CFA, uh, I think it's better than getting an MBA if you want to learn about finance. The CFA is a three-year uh, program. You just write uh, three exams uh, on a Saturday over three years. Uh, and if you want uh, hints on which books to buy, I can tell you how to buy all the books for just 40 bucks. Okay, it's cheap. Um, so you wrote here, um, um, uh, I don't think uh, becoming a CFA is my life calling. I, I don't want to give up. But the time I spend reading the CFA curriculum could be better spent elsewhere. On the other hand, I'm afraid I'd be regretful if I didn't get the CFA. Could you be so kind as, as to help me with this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think you should follow through with it. But I want to show you how to study smarter and not harder when it comes to the CFA. So there's a company called Schweizer, which makes uh, these test prep books. And basically, they take all the thousands and thousands of dollars of textbook you have to buy for the CFA. And they basically make it a, a very, very uh, small number of books. Okay, and Schweizer is owned by Kaplan, which is owned by the Washington Post, which is owned by, Je by Jeff Bezos. And so what you can do is just go to eBay and do a search for Schweizer books. 
and buy them used for about 40 bucks. I think it will help you a lot. Now, one thing I'll say about business is that a lot of business is common sense. But the language of finance and accounting certainly is not. And you have to learn the basics. And the way I teach it in my MBA degree program is I use a lot of props. So it's fun, it's engaging, I think, and you learn by accident. It's great. Um, now, I've started to 3D print my own props as well, which I'm going to be using as part of that, the metaverse. And for people that buy my MBA program, you'll notice later this year, I'm going to be putting and starting to put 100 case studies that are metaverse based. You don't need any equipment uh, to, to watch those optional lessons. You can use one of these things if you want to, or the Oculus product, the app, or just the arrow keys. And so what I'm doing also is I'm putting 3D objects in the metaverse so that my students can learn by going through the metaverse and dragging and drop items. For example, one of the case studies I'm working on, um, and for those of you not familiar with the metaverse, it just means Web 3.0 or the next generation of, of, of internet technologies. But one of the case studies that I'm currently working on, which is going to be a blast, is a hypothetical case study where Apple wants to buy Nintendo. And so we start off the case study in Apple's Cupertino headquarters uh, on, on the metaverse, okay? And, and we're designing it all, it's gonna look beautiful, you'll, you'll love it. Then what we do is uh, we go to Japan to meet with um, a Nintendo's uh, management team and they explain why they don't want the deal to go through. Then we go to New York City on Central Park, a nice view from an office building, and we meet with investment bankers who try to pitch the deal. And then it's your job, my, my students' jobs, or our jobs together, to be able to assemble a combined income statement of both uh, Nintendo and Amazon by dragging and dropping objects to see, to see if the deal is going to be accretive or dilutive. Accretive means it helps earnings growth. Dilutive means it does not. And so I'm using a lot of objects. And you'll notice that here this says sub procedure, and this is just kind of an, an early iteration for my 3D printer. I'm modeling it out now. I'm gonna be teaching programming as well. And I was a programmer for years. Uh, I love coding, I'm getting back to my roots. And I teach programming in the MBA program uh, as a free elective for everybody that's ever bought or will buy. I'm gonna be teaching programming in a lot of detail as a free elective using 3D models. Okay, so this is a sub procedure. When you open up, this is an early rendition. Uh, when you open up the sub uh, procedure, you can see which variables you need to use, functions, macros, etc. That sort of thing. So we'll start off with Excel with VBA and then we'll move on to Python. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, uh, Johanan, how are you? Good to see you. Greetings from India. Great to see you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next up, we got CSS, who is uh, Javier, who's one of my MBA students. Good to see you. Javier wrote, uh, good morning from the East Bay area. Uh, great, great to see you just around the corner from where I live. It was beautiful the past couple days as well. We had a heat wave here. I loved it. Uh, moving on to Sadiq. Uh, who wrote, uh, hi, Chris, good morning. How have you been? I'm always great, thank you. Always great. And, and when you do what you're passionate about doing, and for me, it's teaching, you don't have a job, you have a passion. And that's my goal with my students as well, is to help all my students find their passion. And in my, my MBA program and my courses, uh, what I do is I feel like I'm your humble waiter. I work for you. And when you go to a restaurant, you can order anything you want but you look at uh, you look at everything. You only order a couple things, I should say. You look at all the items. And so my job, my humble job for you, is to expose you to all careers and provide you a ton of frameworks so you can work smarter, not harder, and also find your passion. Yeah. Okay, next up, uh, Ali, who's also in my MBA program. How are you, Ali? Ali wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Um, happy new month, uh, my mentor. Thank you. Same to you. Uh, I unfortunately would not be able to attend class today. Uh, I'm hosting uh, visitors and trying to be a good host. I will, however, uh, definitely catch up later. Yeah, thank you. It's always great to see you. Thank you. We've gone to George. Uh, George, uh, <laughs> George is one of my, my MBA students that graduated last year. Uh, he's from Texas. Uh, he flew in. I met with him during graduation last year, and, and he gave me this when I met him. It says, don't mess with Texas. I love it. George, great to see you. You always put a smile on my face, buddy. George graduated from Baylor. Um, so George wrote, hello from the heart of Texas. Uh, Chris, what is the date for the 2022 graduation? Yeah. So we have an annual alumni event and graduation, um, and basically it's uh, a couple days every year. 
uh, and you don't have to graduate to show up. You can just show up to network with tons of other people. Um, so last year it was December 18th, which was a Saturday. This year it's going to be December 17th, which is a Saturday. Uh, and so we'll have a whole day of events on Saturday. And then on Sunday, December 18th of 2022, later this year, uh, I'll do 12 hours in a row of, of in-person one-on-ones like I did last year. Thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing you again, buddy. Okay. Uh, next up, we got Manas from India who wrote, uh, good morning, my, my dear mentor, Chris, please. Uh, how are you today? Um, you definitely need to do something with the background. It looks plain and incomplete <laughs> to me. Just try something your kids like. Um, uh, they know this space a lot. Yeah, no, I, I kind of like it. I don't know. But, but thanks for your feedback. I appreciate it. Actually, what we did is I have a 3D printer. So we were printing out blocks of stuff as well uh, to put lettering in the background. And Matt Lacuse, my wonderful chief creative officer, designed uh, an entire logo set in the background, which we have. It's got Velcro on the back so I can stick it to the cloth wall. Uh, and I'll be putting that up soon. I will put it up next week. Thank you. Okay, and Andre wrote, uh, greetings from uh, uh, Dallas. Oh, cool. Excellent. Good to see you. Um, uh, Sadiq wrote, how do I get into PE, which means private equity, or VC funds, meaning venture capital? What are the prerequisites? I'm a chartered accountant now, and I'm pursuing a CFA, but it's difficult to get into PE and VC funds. Yeah, so I'll answer this from a generic perspective, so it applies to everybody. When you see a job opening online and you apply for it, your probability of getting that job is literally one out of 250. And so the person that often gets the job is the person that knows someone at the company. And so the way I teach you in my MBA program how to get a job is radically different. I teach you how to network to meet lots of people at a company you want to work at. And then I teach you how to ask them to help you out in terms of cross-selling you internally to get that job. And so when it comes to venture capital and the private equity market, I would do the exact same thing as well. And you can always uh, leverage LinkedIn and send messages to people that work at these firms that have something in common with you. And I explain the methodology in much more detail, as well as how to ace any interview uh, in my MBA program. Now, in terms of venture capital, I would not go into that sector until you've started a company. And the reason I say that is because if you go into venture capital, and you don't have startup experience, what happens is this. You can progress throughout the organization, but it'll be hard to make partner. And the reason is because venture capitalists invest in startups and the startups choose them as well. And the startups choose them based on their work experience as well. And so if you invest in a company and you work in VC or even private equity, you sit on the boards of these companies and you give them advice based on your experience as well. So I humbly think it makes sense to wait uh, until you've had a lot more startup experience and maybe you have already. Yeah. And if that's the case, I would just work on networking, which I explain in my MBA program. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Manas, who doesn't like my background, uh, wrote uh, uh, my mentor uh, this week. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, I had a small chat uh, with the vice president of, of ADA. Uh, he, uh, he's a great guy. And again, your LinkedIn course worked the magic as always. Your crypto course is way ahead of its time. You're Picasso. No, thank you. I appreciate that. What Picasso once said is, everything you imagine is real. I love that. Okay. Moving on to uh, uh, another question from Manas, which is, I published two more courses this week on Udemy. Awesome. And I'm on day 75 of my vlogging journey. Excellent. Loving the experience. And it's crazy to do the impossible. Very cool. Yeah. It's it's tough. It's, when you first get started uh, vlogging or opining over social media, LinkedIn, etc., it will feel like you're screaming into the wind. Yeah, and you got to be long-term focused because it's a marathon and not a sprint. And your competition will give up early, I promise you. Okay, moving on to JTF2. First time I've, I've, I've seen you here. Uh, I, I'd love to, to see you again on the call as well. Um, uh, uh, so JTF2 wrote, can you tell us the story of how you ended up uh, teaching at Stanford? Yeah. So I wasn't a full professor there, but I lectured there a lot. Uh, and I helped out uh, Ilya, 
uh, a lot with his venture capital classes. Let, let me show you um, uh, Ilya here. He's great. Uh, and there's there's a long lineup at Stanford to get into his class uh, every single year. Uh, I'll tell you how I network to get that gig, though, in, in a second. I think you'll enjoy it. There's Ginny, one of my students, graduated last year. And there's George as well. Good to see you. OK, so Ilya. Here he is here. So he's a professor at Stanford. Um, I think he's the only one that teaches a venture capital class there as, as well. Um, so what I did was um, I, I was working in venture capital uh, and I was teaching during the evenings at a couple of Bay Area universities. Uh, and I called and emailed uh, the dean of Stanford Business School a number of times and she didn't respond. And so I called and eventually she picked up. Right. I decided I'm not leaving voicemails anymore. I was polite in my, my tact, but, but I was uh, um, I was relentless. And I asked her, I, I said, I would love to um, start to guest lecture uh, at, at Stanford uh, Business School. Uh, and she said, OK, well, reach out to the professors and just tell them I said to reach out to them. Uh, and she had to go. She was, she was in a hurry. So I emailed every single professor there. Uh, and, and I mentioned that I, I spoke with the dean and that she suggested I reach out. And almost every professor responded immediately. It was great, uh, including uh, Myron Scholes, uh, who created Black Scholes, which is uh, part of options uh, pricing methodology. Um, so that's, that's what I did. Yeah. And I met with Elia as well. Great guy. I went to his house as well for, for his, his birthday years ago. Uh, we're friends. He's a great guy. Yeah. OK. Uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, Russia is going big on everything. Uh, do you think it'll affect the market, especially at oil at 120 uh, bucks now? Uh, Russia is de is destroying every gas station and supply pool in Ukraine, bastards. Yeah, yeah. So oil will probably go to 150. Um, the problem is with with Putin, um, he's he's had this vision for his whole life. Like when he was in university, uh, he he studied he did a degree in geology, and his thesis was how does Russia or the Soviet Union USSR at the time how do they control uh, the world's commodities? And so the problem is with, with Russia, they control almost all of oil uh, that ships uh, to, and gas that ships to, to Europe. And so it's a conundrum. And they've got a, a bunch of great energy companies that I'll never invest in because the accounting is, is fraudulent. Uh, and I, I got screwed out of bad investments there years ago including Gazprom and Luke Oil. I did due diligence in those companies. Uh, the companies were trading at three times earnings, but those earnings were off. Okay. Uh, and so um, what, what happens is those companies and the natural resources companies in Russia, they control most of the flow of oil and gas that goes to Europe. So it's a conundrum. And what breaks my heart is that if you take Ukraine and, and Russia, um, they're the biggest exporters of wheat in the world. And places like Egypt, where my father was born, I've never been there, I'd love to go. But places like Egypt, the bulk of their, their wheat imports comes from that region of the world. So it's a conundrum. I, I don't think that there should be economic sanctions in place when it comes to wheat, that's for sure. But with energy, it's, it's rough, it's rough. And hopefully this motivates the whole world uh, to get off of oil and to start embracing next generation um, battery technologies from companies like, like Tesla. Um, now, the, there's a famous, famous Saudi oil executive in Riyadh who once said, the stone age did not end because they ran out of stones. And I hope that our dependence on oil uh, is a thing of the past. Okay. All right, next up, Abdur wrote, uh, inf influencer merchandise business, is it good uh, or not? Yeah, I, I think it's a very, very low margin business. Now, I, I had actually merch uh, on, on my YouTube channel. It might still be there. I don't think it is. If it is, don't buy any of this stuff. I'm about to take it down. Um, you can get it done for free um, if you use YouTube a lot like I do. Uh, but the quality is not that great. Yeah. Um, now, don't expect that a merchandising business uh, is going to make you a fortune. It's very, very competitive, the t-shirt business, etc. Yeah. If you want to get into that business and help a company, uh, I would work on things that are more scalable, like social media strategies. Yeah. All right. Uh, ne next up, um, uh, Manas wrote, the person whom you'll be interviewing this week is someone I've known for a long time now. Oh, you know him. Cool. Uh, would love to see you with him asking him a bunch of questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so tomorrow, uh, what I'm doing here at my house is I'm interviewing uh, Varun uh, uh, Puri. 
in Varun, um, great guy. He immigrated from Egypt, uh, or pardon me, from, from India. Uh, and, and he got a job at Google uh, reporting to one of the two founders working on special projects. And he started a company uh, where what he does is he teaches people how to leverage AI to present much, much better. And you can go to uh, utily.ai uh, for more details. And let me go there with you. It's, it's, he's, he's raised over a million dollars in, in VC funding uh, from top venture capital firms, but I'll be interviewing him tomorrow in a lot more detail. Utily. Dot AI. Here it is here. And basically the way this works, uh, this this program, this uh, website he started, which you can use for free, try it today if you want to, um, is you present and the AI algorithm here will give you feedback on your presentation. You know, for example, did you use the word um or ah too many times, etc. And on this website, he's got a demo analyzing a speech uh, from uh, from Elon Musk. So uh, again, I'll be interviewing um, uh, Varun, Varun Puri uh, tomorrow here at my house, uh, and that will go live. We'll probably publish it at some point next week. And, and if you have questions uh, uh, for Varun, uh, please email support at haroonventures.com. And what I'll do is I'll ask those questions on your behalf tomorrow when I interview him again here at my house. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, Abdur, um, um, okay, wrote the same questions before many times. That's okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, next, next question is, if this war crisis goes on for two more weeks, do you think it'll crash the market, both crypto and stock market? The Indian market is down 10% for weeks now. Your thoughts on this? Yeah. All ships sink at the same time, to the extent that uh, a lot of risk assets have been taken off the table. And so global stock markets have pulled back. Uh, and most major markets are in correction territory. I have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, that's why I don't believe in being a, a day trader, uh, because there are geopolitical events that make stocks go up or down that you just can't control. Uh, and so I'm just a long-term investor. Yeah, But I do pray every day that this, this ends quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Charlie wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Hey, Charlie. Um, how do you make this background uh, image? Yeah, so this is not a, it's, it's not an image. This is a, this is actually a shelf I have up here. Um, and I've got the, the focus on my face here so that it, it gets out of focus. Yeah, so yeah, just a shelf. And in the background, so I've got, I've got lights here uh, and these are called uh, uh, DMX lights and, and I control them all with, uh, with my computer. And this is what um, uh, a lot of DJs use. Uh, and so DMX lighting basically means all the lights are connected to each other. You can daisy chain them as, as, as well. I, I like blue, it's my, my favorite color, whoops. That's the one I think. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Next question is, uh, what is your outlook uh, on the stock market for the next two years? Yeah. I, I never look at it that way. I like to back up the truck and buy a lot of stocks when the VIX spikes a lot, the VIX index. When it spikes to 70 or 80, uh, which occurred in 2008, as well as in March of 2020, when it spikes to 70 or 80, it's going to feel like the world is ending, but you have to buy stocks no matter what, when that happens, because things are never as bad as we think. And so I'm very long-term focused. Uh, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. When I value companies and when I invest in them, I always look for five by fives, meaning a 500% return within five years. I'm wrong a lot of the time, but I don't like trying to chase stocks for 10 or 15% upside here and there. I like to roll up my sleeves and write a detailed research report, which I teach in my MBA program. And I do a detailed financial model, which I teach in my MBA program as well. And I value companies based on my earnings estimates in five or 10 years from now. So a lot of people look at PEs based on earnings today or just next year. And they'll say, oh my God, that stock is expensive at 100 times PE. Well, for me, if I love a company and I do research and my earnings estimates are so big in five or 10 years, then the company only trades at two or three times my five to 10 year uh, estimates of earnings. And I, again, I teach all this in my MBA class. And I don't know the path, but I know, I know the destination on a lot of stocks I do a lot of work on. Yes, I do make mistakes, but you just can't forecast the volatility because each month has 20 trading days, meaning 20 weekdays when the market's open. So you gotta be long-term focused always. And there's a reason why we don't know the names of that many day traders out there. Yeah, because it's not sustainable. 
Okay. And those hedge funds, a lot of hedge funds are corrupt. Not all of them. I worked in that industry for years. You know, I had friends that went to jail. I went to visit them. I never did anything wrong. But a lot of hedge funds are corrupt. And basically, a hedge fund that makes money every single month, it's almost impossible to do. Uh, a lot of them rely on insider information. Certainly not all of them. There are a lot of really good ones out there. Uh, but it's brutal trying to be short-term focused. It makes you do things you don't want to do. Okay, uh, next question is, what is your opinion on, on Dan uh, uh, Pena? Um, I, I don't know who this person is. If, if that's a vlogger, uh, let me know. Um, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Mick wrote, um, hi, Chris. Hey, uh, do you think China will be sanctioned when they keep publicly supporting Russia? Meanwhile, Chinese banks are pulling their money from Russia. Um, uh, what would sanctions cost to the Chinese economy? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that the Chinese uh, uh, banks are pulling money from Russia. Yeah. So there's a there's concern out there that if, if the world allows um, Russia to invade uh, the Ukraine and try to reassemble that awful communist bloc uh, that they had years ago, um, and if China doesn't say anything negative about that, there's concern that maybe that gives permission for China maybe to go and take back Taiwan. Uh, which would be an absolute disaster. And so I'm glad the whole world is, is putting very strict economic sanctions uh, on, on Russia right now because they're basically signaling, if any country does this, we're going to sanction you as well. And, and so China, for uh, I don't think they, they do it, but uh, there's a lot of saber rattling they will. Uh, China, for many years now, they've been trying to transition from an economy that's focused on exporting to an economy that's focused on growing their domestic economy. So they're not reliant uh, on the United States or as much as they are right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, ne next up, Eric wrote, um, I had a manager who was not interested in listening to me. Uh, ha happened to me a lot in my career. Uh, I was pretty upset about a, a knee injury. Uh, they were negligent in causing. Oh, interesting. She had a high opinion of herself. I told her that the best managers uh, uh, listen. Yeah. If you were injured at work, and, and I don't know if I'm reading this correct, but if you were injured at work, what I would do is I would get, um, I, I get a lawyer involved. And lawyers don't cost as much as you think. If you go to LegalZoom.com, um, you can hire a lawyer there for $15 an hour or $15 per half hour. With a, with a six month contract, yeah. And if you don't have legal Zoom in your country, just do a search for what is the legal Zoom equivalent in your country's name, yeah. And, and don't worry, if you guys are being uh, treated poorly at, at a company, it, it sucks. Um, and look, I've been bullied at companies I've worked at before. I've, I've been called incompetent. Um, I've, I've worked for a lot of people that should not be managing people. I've also worked for wonderful people as well. And if that happens to you, and it happens to many of us, I want you to kind of have a positive attitude about it by thinking to yourself, what's good about this? I always say it to myself, what is positive about the situation? And what might be positive is that frustration leads to breakthrough. Frustration leads to reinvention. Frustration at work leads you to want to interview and get a better job making more money or better yet, start your own business. And that's what I'm here for, is to humbly help you start your, your own business through my Venture Capital Bootcamp as part of my MBA degree program. But probably the, the most proud vlog I've ever done, uh, and you can go to my, my LinkedIn profile to check this out. Um, I, I did one on, on corporate bullying, right? So if you go to my, my LinkedIn profile, uh, if you scroll down, there's, uh, I think it's the first one here. Here it is here, yeah. Let's talk about corporate bullying. And I wanna open this up here because I want to sh I want to um, uh, show you the, the links here as well. Okay, not to my stuff. Okay, I'm not promoting me at all. Um, so if you're bullied at work, I provide you with plenty of resources here from the Harvard Business Review, uh, Cora, which I love going to, National Health Service in England, BBC in England, Forbes, uh, AARP, and Human Rights uh, in, in Australia down here. Okay, so anyway, you can check out that that vlog uh, if you want to. Okay. And I'm actually going to take a quick break. This is a one minute vlog, so please bear with me. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. If you bully people, give me one second. To this is one second long. It's the vlog I'm most proud of, and I'll be right back. I promise you. Hold on a second. Stay with me, guys. Thanks. If you're a corporate bully, then I want you to keep watching this up. 
If you bully people at work, meaning if you're a corporate bully, then I want you to keep watching this. Otherwise, don't watch the rest of this vlog. It's going to be out there today. But for you, the corporate bully, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being such a jerk. And by the way, you peaked in high school and you're so insecure that you treat people poorly. I get it. I get it. You're really insecure. I understand. But you know what? In a bizarre way, and I think what you've done at work, treating people poorly is disgusting. But I think in a bizarre way, I want to thank you because you've motivated the people that you've treated poorly to quit and to join another company, or you've motivated them to start their own companies. You see, frustration in business can be a beautiful thing. And I say it with love in my heart, because if you're frustrated at work because you're treat, being treated poorly, and I've been treated poorly many times before, then that forces you to get outside your comfort zone and get a better job, or better yet, start your own company. If I can be resourceful in any way, helping you start your own company, please let me know. Thank you. Not the bullies, just the people who are being bullied, like I was. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, I, I'm back here. That was like a, an awful commercial or infomercial break there. All right, uh, uh, next up, uh, Mike uh, has a question, which is, uh, hi, Chris. Hey, I started reading a book uh, about uh, Navinder uh, Sararo, uh, who is the, the Hound of Hounslow, uh, the futures trader responsible for the flash crash of 2010. Uh, they say he made $70 million trading uh, from his bedroom. Any thoughts? Yeah, I remember that day very well. So the flash crash was, um, it was a day when the market uh, dropped over 10%, like every stock really, really quickly. Uh, and I remember uh, I was in Potrero Hill, which is uh, in San Francisco. It's where one of my, my offices were uh, in my hedge fund venture capital firm. And I ran back to my desk to see what the hell was going on and if I could buy stuff on the cheap, but it was too late. I, I missed it. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of that person, uh, but that person probably made that much money uh, by, by using puts. Yeah. You probably had puts on major market indexes like the SPY. If you want to learn more about options, um, I, you go to my, my website, learn more, and I added it as well as an elective, uh, a 30 hour elective to my MBA program. And anybody that bought my MBA program or will buy it will get that and all my new content forever for free. Yeah. Okay, next up, Kamar wrote, uh, how do I sign up for your MBA program? I've signed up uh, for the Udemy one already. Yeah, on Udemy, I have a, I have a course, uh, which is um, uh, seven and a half or eight hours called an entire MBA uh, in one course. Um, if, if you're interested in my, my MBA, you can go to um, go to my website, okay? And then just scroll down to, to learn more about it. Yeah, uh, and so there's, there's three versions. There's uh, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, I'm in my third year of doing these one-year live programs. Okay, and the next one actually is going to start, this year sold out. Next one's going to start February of next year. But what you can do is sign up for the silver version, which is like Netflix, 30-day um, money-back guarantee. And it gives you guaranteed acceptance at a discount to these ones here in the future if you're interested. Yeah. And if you have more questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, and in the bottom right-hand corner on my website, you'll notice there's a little green message box where you guys can type questions and my staff will get back to you. Thanks. Okay, moving on to uh, Anna Rag, who wrote, Hey, Chris, hope all is well, likewise. Can you please explain about hedge funds? Is it fair to assume that they trade on options? Not all of them do. Not all of them do. So a hedge fund is like a mutual fund where you can buy stocks, but hedge funds can also do the opposite of buying stocks, which is called shorting stocks. They can bet that stocks are going to go down and make money that way. Now, some of the more sophisticated hedge funds use a lot of options as well. So when I worked at a big hedge fund called Citadel, we used uh, options quite a bit. Um, and I, I've used options at basically every hedge fund I've worked at. Uh, but we don't make it our primary focus, or at least I did not. I like to use options as a way to protect my capital um, just in case a stock crashes. For example, let's say that I own a, a stock, uh, shares in salesforce.com, ticker CRM. And I own, I own a lot of it. And if I sell it, uh, it might drag the stock down, right? If you're an institutional investor, you have big sizes, positions. So what I would do is I would spend a little bit of money to buy a put. And what would happen is if the stock drops, I make a lot of money and I actually don't lose money because my shares go down, the put offsets it. If the stock goes up, I make money because the shares go up, but all I lose is this little amount here on the put. And there are much more advanced uh, options, um, um, uh, option strategies as well. There, there's straddles, uh, strangles, uh, 
iron butterflies, iron condors, etc. Check out my MBA program uh, in the fourth semester in FA44. That's finance and accounting semester four, class four. I have a 30 hour uh, elective covering that. Yeah. Now the government goes after people that buy options and there's, there's a takeover. So a lot of hedge funds are now more sophisticated to the extent that if they think a company is going to get acquired, um, management won't let them invest in options in that company, even if they don't have any insider information. Because what happens is the government investigates you if you buy massive options right ahead of a takeover. Yeah. Okay. Next up, uh, Kumar. Hey, Kumar, how are you? Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, uh, cur- uh, and, and I had a, a, a CEO of a company I invested in called Versa Networks uh, named uh, Kumar. Uh, and his brother was named Arpurva, Arpurva, and they started here in the Bay Area. Great guys, first in networks. Uh, so Kumar wrote, hi, Chris. Currently, uh, I'm reading uh, Financial Shenanigans uh, Recommended by You, which is a great book uh, for investors. I'm surprised by the tactics used by boards to fraud investors. Uh, thanks a lot for this. You're most welcome. So Financial Shenanigans is, is a book uh, written about uh, financial fraud and how you can find patterns in financial statements for short ideas. And it was written by Howard Schillett, who started uh, Cifra, uh, which was a, a big uh, finance sell-side firm. And I was one of his customers years ago in the hedge fund market. Yeah, great book and good guy. Moving on to uh, Anna Rag, who wrote, hey, Chris, um, how do I sign up for your affiliate program? Yeah, I get, I'm getting a lot of questions about that lately. Um, so if you're interested, um, uh, what you can do, and I, I've never really advertised this, but the place where I host my courses is called uh, Teachables. And um, if you sell my courses, anybody can sign up to do it. Uh, then you get, I don't know, 20% of the revenue, that sort of thing. So if anybody's interested in that, it's a pretty simple process. Just email support at haroonventures.com and I'll have my business development team uh, uh, answer that question. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, moving on to, uh, to Kumar who wrote, can you please suggest a few more books? Uh, I, I'd love to know uh, a, a few more uh, from your desk. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I love audiobooks. I think anytime you can listen to an audiobook about um, a business person that inspires you is a wonderful thing because when people become successful, they put their cards down and they share their secrets. And that way you can work smarter and not harder in terms of re-architecting your life or your business. So anybody inspires you, listen to audiobooks about them. There's a great one uh, about uh, Steve Jobs written by Walter Isaacson, fantastic book. Uh, I would check that out. And Walter Isaacson apparently is working on an Elon Musk uh, biography right now. And there's plenty of books out there about Elon. My favorite books, though, by business executives are the ones that actually read the books themselves. Because one of the reasons they became successful is because they can sell. And you can hear it in their voice as well. And so you listen to anything that Sir Richard Branson from the Virgin Media Empire uh, publishes. I, I think they're great. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about sales and personal development, probably my, my favorite book in that area uh, from somebody with real life experience is uh, by Bill McDermott uh, called The Winner's Dream. Uh, and Bill was the co-CEO of, of SAP for many years. Now he's the CEO of ServiceNow, ticker NOW. My go-to book that I recommend to everybody just starting in business, though, is a book by Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life. Listen to that book. I promise you it'll change your perspective on business and relationships in life in general and will help to take your career or personal life to the next level. All right, moving on to Elias. Hey, Elias. Um, my wife, Christine, has a, has a cousin uh, named Elias here in the Bay Area. Um, he's at the Mayo Clinic now, smart guy. So Elias wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Uh, we're going to open an aesthetic uh, clinic, uh, but treatments are expensive. Uh, high income locations have way more competition. What would be your take on opening uh, the business on a lower income location? Oh, it's hard, man. It's hard because when it comes to real estate, the three most important things are location, location, location. What I would probably do is I'd learn a lot, and this is a very generic answer, but I'd I'd learn a lot about social media marketing, okay? Um, And if you do that, then the location of your office is not as important. And the best way to do social media marketing is to learn from Gary Vaynerchuk. And so let me summarize Gary Vaynerchuk's philosophy in one minute. Create content and repurpose it on different platforms. 
So for me, I create this weekly uh, YouTube call and we repurpose the seven best questions through seven vlogs throughout the week. We also repurpose uh, little clips of videos on Instagram, etc. Think of yourself as a thought leader, like the Rodin sculpture, I think therefore I am. And if you opine a lot and give your opinion a lot, eventually you become a thought leader and eventually the media reaches out to you for interviews as well. It takes time though, and you gotta be long-term focused. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So whatever it is you're most passionate about, and this goes to everybody in this call, whatever it is you're most passionate about uh, industry-wise and career-wise, I want you to publish content on LinkedIn as well as YouTube on a weekly or a monthly basis. And becoming a thought leader is self-fulfilling. I think therefore I am. And after a while, if you keep it up and you never give up like your competition will, that eventually you'll get free publicity and free media attention as well, which will help to sell your product as well. Okay, uh, next up is a question from uh, uh, Ren Veer, uh, who wrote, hey Chris, uh, I also don't like trading, but uh, what are your thoughts on using mathematical probability to trade? Uh, not like Jim Simmons from Renaissance, but with high school statistics, uh, math, for example, normal distribution, et cetera. Yeah, so I do a lot of that. Um, and I teach that uh, in my MBA program in the fourth semester, uh, FA44, where I spend 30 hours teaching you how to in do advanced investing. We start from the basics. Uh, and I teach you normal probability as well in a fun way. And this is a Galton board. Of course, we have normal distribution here. Uh, and you really have to understand statistics in a fun and intuitive way to be a successful investor with more complex advanced trading strategies. Again, I teach you all about this uh, in the fourth semester of my MBA program. I teach you also how to value options using three different met methodologies, Black-Scholes, uh, as well as the, the binomial pricing theorem. And I teach you also about Monte Carlo uh, uh, pricing, okay, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, this is one of my mini props and I'm starting to 3D print my, my props as, as well now. Uh, but um, basically Monte Carlo simulation is how casinos work, okay? And they look at probabilities and they try to make a little bit of money on every trade. All right, it's a one-armed bandit. Okay, moving on uh, to Manas who wrote, do you think big companies are bullish about the metaverse, sp uh, specifically metaverse advertising and metaverse business in general? Yeah, I don't think people really know where the industry is going to go, but everybody knows it's going to be big. Kind of like uh, 10 or 15 years ago, everybody knew that voice as an operating system platform was going to be huge. Um, and that's why you know a lot of big companies have, have voice-based technologies. We know them on our cell phones, et cetera. And so a lot of companies, what they do is the, the smart ones know that if they own the platforming in the road, then they can charge the cars. And those are the best business models in history, like Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. They all own a platform and they charge the cars. And so when it comes to, to the metaverse, Nobody knows what the platform is going to look like, but every major company is investing in it now. This is Nintendo's product. Uh, of course, you've seen Facebook. They purchased uh, Oculus. Microsoft bought HoloLens. Um, PlayStation has got uh, the, their second iteration of the VR product coming out later this year, maybe next year. They haven't had a new one in five years. And there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry as well. You know, you had uh, Microsoft buying Activision, partially because of Metaverse. You had, uh, you had Take Two, the, the parent owner of GTA. Uh, they purchased Zynga, and you had Sony recently buy uh, Bungie, which is the company that makes Halo. Yeah, so a lot of companies are getting in the space. Nobody knows what it's going to look like. Facebook is so convinced it's going to be a big deal that Facebook renamed themselves Meta as well, and also because they're going to be broken up into different companies soon, kind of like why Google named themselves Alphabet because YouTube is going to be spun off. And yeah, um, but everybody knows it's going to be big. Nobody knows how or when but it will happen. And it's gonna be self-fulfilling because so many different tech companies are pouring in so much money in terms of R&D and eventual advertising as well in this market. Now, per your question on, on advertising in general, um, it'll kind of be like uh, uh, in-game advertisements. Like when you play FIFA, for example, what my, my son Andrew's favorite game, when you play FIFA, you can see advertisements on, on, the, um, you know, on the sidelines as well. So I think that's, that's how it's gonna work initially. You'll be able to place ads within rooms, et cetera. And that will finance your growth or your business uh, investment in, in the metaverse in general. And so our, our metaverse uh, uh, case studies are coming out later this year uh, in my MBA program, which will be a lot of fun. 
Okay, next up, uh, Eric wrote, I, I joined uh, several data analytics groups uh, on LinkedIn. I'm hoping to set up uh, those 10 informational interviews and get a job uh, doing uh, data analytics uh, soon. Excellent. And uh, Eric, if, if you're in the, the, the Silver uh, MBA program um, at 10 a.m. today, uh, I'm doing my weekly one-hour webcast with my Silver students. We can do a Zoom if you want. And I'll go through your LinkedIn profile and humbly make changes to make you more successful. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to be teaching data analytics very soon as well. Going back to my roots. Next up, we have uh, Thomas wrote, uh, hey, Chris, you're, you're awesome. No, no, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is, I, 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 I love doing this. It's fun. I love serving my students. You are, I hope you're having an awesome day. Thanks. Likewise. Moving on to Daniel, who wrote, Tesla has ab abandoned plans to make a $25,000 car. BYD, which is a ticket for Boyd, is making cars in the $25,000 range. Will BYD be block selling cars uh, in the United States? Oh, because it's Chinese. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, if it was Russian, of course. Um, who wants to buy a Lada? But no, no, I, I don't think they'd be blocked there. Uh, unless there's there's certain semiconductor technology in the cars that connect to Wi-Fi, whatever, which I, I don't think is going to happen. Meaning if the semiconductors are made by Chinese companies. Yeah, I don't think they'd be blocked, no. And I hope they answer the U.S. Because I, I, I don't want us to be dependent on oil forever. Or Putin wins. Moving on to Manas, who wrote, uh, whatever Russia is doing, and the way uh, West and NATO are responding, do you think because Russia is the gas leader and largest grain producer, it has an advantage uh, even with the restrictions? You know, Putin is kind of like Kasparov, but not as smart. Um, he's, he's like a master chess player. He thinks a couple of moves ahead. Um, and so I'm sure he thought about it. You know, what if there's economic sanctions globally? But if the price of oil rises and natural gas a lot, Will that much more than offset the money he's losing from uh, the lack of international trade given sanctions? Yeah, and so I'm sure he has a statistical model like that. But I don't think he was expecting this much of a, you know, of, of a Heisman from the, from the rest of the world in terms of economic sanctions, which I'm glad to see. Okay, Ahmed uh, wrote here, and give me one second, guys. So I've got this, this new keyboard that works with both computers. So I'm going to switch here and do a search on the name Ahmed because it just jumped on me. It happens sometimes. There we go. So uh, uh, Ahmed wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed uh, Dal Dalsari uh, from Saudi Arabia. Great to see you. I have a number of students from Riyadh uh, in my MBA program. Um, and you wrote, thank you for your time, uh, humbleness and genu genuity. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to passively invest for income. Are REITs good options uh, and what are other options? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you and welcome. I hope you join us again. Um, so uh, for those of you not familiar with REITs, um, REITs are like stocks, but for real estate. And so REITs stands for Real Estate Investment Trusts. And there are tickers for them you can invest in. And the way it works is in most countries, by law, if you're going to set up a pool of capital and create a REIT, meaning an investment in a lot of office buildings or strip malls, you have to pay 90% of your operating profit as dividends. And so most REITs have very high dividends, okay, like high single digits. If you see a REIT or any stock that has a dividend yield over 20%, please don't just buy it because it might have a high yield for a reason, like there's a massive lawsuit. Uh, or the company might have going concern issues. But I think that if you don't own your own house or your own apartment, I, I think that some residential REIT investments in the area you live is a good way to diversify your product, your portfolio of, of investments. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question is, do you think that honest, Honesty Ukraine is fighting alone, even though the West and others are supporting them, um, it's okay if you don't want to answer this. I, I know it's, it's quite sensitive. Yeah. <sighs> hindsight, hindsight is 2020, but, but I'm sure the United States government is now thinking, I wish we didn't take troops out of, uh, out of, uh, Afghanistan. Um, by having military presence, 
uh, in Europe uh, by the United States and other countries, of course, um, it kind of deters uh, any sort of negative geopolitical activity. Uh, and so I, I think what's going to happen is the U.S. will be sending over more troops and a lot of aid as well. Um, but I hope it doesn't get out of hand. Yeah. And what's happened in the past, uh, uh, the past 48 hours is we've seen more diplomacy changes and geopolitical activity uh, from a Cold War perspective by European countries than we have in the past 30 years. And so without a doubt, without a doubt, we are now entering the second Cold War. Uh, next question is from Enkit, which is, uh, Chris, is doing an MBA worth doing in 2022? Yeah. Um, so let me talk about traditional business schools and then I'll, I'll talk about mine. So I think the only reason you should get an MBA from a traditional school is if you've tried everything you possibly can to change careers and you can't do it. So what does that mean? So before spending $100,000 to get a two-year MBA, and there's also lost revenue because you, be, you won't be working that. Before spending $100,000, what I want you to do is this. I want you to set up 100 networking meetings with people on, on LinkedIn, which I teach in my affordable MBA. And if after those 100 networking meetings that you do, okay, and you won't get a response to all of them. I, I mean, really 100 meetings, meaning Zoom calls or in-person coffees. If after doing 100 of those meetings, you still can't change careers, then I would consider getting an MBA from a traditional school. And so think of those 100 meetings as costing you $1,000 per meeting. Because that's the cost of an MBA, $100,000 from a traditional school. And again, they don't teach you the most important aspects of business to make you successful. They don't teach you how to sell. They don't teach you how to get a job. They don't teach you how to manage your own money. They don't teach you how to present. They don't teach you how to network, etc. A lot of the stuff they teach is theoretical stuff like supply and demand graphs, which maybe were relevant last century. They haven't kept up with the technology times. In my program, in my, uh, my, my MBA program, I teach stuff that's going to help you immediately guess the next level, including coding, which I'm adding soon. These are subroutines. And I suck at 3D printing. I'm trying my best. Yeah. It's fun. I'm, I'm learning. Because when one teaches, two learn. Okay. Uh, moving on to the Berlin, uh, who is uh, uh, one of my MBA students uh, from San Bernardino here in California, where Ken, Griff Ken Griffey Jr. play the minor leagues. So the Berlin wrote, uh, Chris, uh, when it comes to price to revenue, uh, now, for those of you not familiar with price to revenue, when you value a company, a lot of times you look at price to earnings, which means on the denominator's earnings, on numerator's price. Always think of denominators being the number one. So price to earnings means for every $1 in earnings, how many times that $1 are investors willing to pay for that company? If it's growing faster, they'll pay more. If it's not growing as fast, they'll pay less. Now, some companies don't have earnings today, which is why people like to look at price to revenue, which means for every $1 in revenue on the denominator, how many times that $1 are investors willing to pay? And it's a way that investment bankers and hedge funds value companies that are not yet profitable. So the question is, on price to revenue companies that trade at 10 times revenue or less, investors will pay $10 or less because there is no earnings and $10 is the most they'll pay uh, more than they uh, can uh, if it's not profitable. Yeah, it all depends on the sector and at what point we are uh, in the market cycle. For example, in the summer of 2012, when three wonderful cloud software companies went public that I participated in, Splunk, ticker SPLK, ServiceNow, ticker N-O-W, and Workday, uh, ticker W-D-A-Y, those four companies were not very profitable. And so at that point in time for cloud software companies, investors were willing to pay 15 to 20 times revenue at that point in time. So the bottom line is you have to look at the competition and see how investors are valuing other companies on a price to revenue basis in the same sector. Now, if you're investing in a retail startup, <clears throat> the price to revenue might be one or two times. Uh, and, and the reason is because it's tough to compete with Amazon and the margins are much, much less versus high margins with software companies. Good to see you. Christina, uh, Christina is uh, our fearless leader. Um, she is uh, the head of the Haroon Education Ventures uh, alumni department. She graduated last year along with her husband, uh, a Christian. She's wonderful. Good to see you. Um, and she did an amazing job with the graduation as well, including a kick-ass speech. Good to see you as always. 
So Christina wrote, uh, Chris, uh, good morning, uh, and our amazing global uh, MBA uh, and weekly webcast family. Hope you're having an outstanding week so far. Cheers, Chris. I'm at 10 a.m. water and only 400 steps. How about you? Yeah. And we all compete. I love it. Competition is good for the consumer for us. So I'm only at 8 a.m. Uh, I'm definitely behind. I have to drink all this before the end of the day. I carry this to the gym with me now. It's so good to get out and go to the real gym. In terms of steps, uh, I usually suck at steps um, during this call because I'm not walking on my treadmill below me. Um, but I'm at 147 steps. I, I got a long way to go to get to my 10 to 20,000 steps today. And I've, I've started taking fewer steps recently because I'm trying to put back on some, some muscle mass that I lost last year with an injury. Yeah. And I, my new toy is this. It's called an Ura ring which measures my, my sleep quality. It's not, it, this is my real ring. My sleep quality and much, much more. Uh, and it will also tell me, uh, just on, on the app, it's Bluetooth, it'll tell me if I should not exercise on a certain day. It's called readiness. And if I exercise when my readiness is not great per this ring, then I'll have a higher probability of getting sick. It's pretty cool. And I'm a nerd and you know it. Moving on to, to Harsh. Uh, Harsh, how are you? Harsh wrote, Chris, I, I think it's America who is responsible for the war. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I agree, um, but, but everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I respect yours. Uh, and then you wrote, uh, I've been studying geopolitics. According to me, Putin is, is getting uh, unnecessary hate. Um, the West is also trying to increase its power. It's not good for countries like India. Yeah, anytime one country invades another and there's a single death, uh, then that country is at fault. Uh, and so I, I, I think Putin is definitely at fault. And, you know, hundreds of, of innocent civilians have, have died uh, in, in the Ukraine. And there's been a million people that have left to, to immigrate to other countries. And God bless those European countries that they're allowing refugees to stay from the Ukraine for two years, including free school, et cetera. And Israel actually is, is, is flying a lot of people, orphans, et cetera, uh, from the Ukraine uh, back to, to Italy, it, or pardon me, back to Israel. And one of my students in my MBA program, the Platinum program, I won't reveal his name unless he wants me to. Um, he and his family just relocated uh, from Kiev uh, to uh, Jerusalem. Yeah. So the whole world is doing their part in trying to keep Russia in check. Yeah. It's good to see you. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Eric wrote, I'm a big fan of Dan Pena, the trillion dollar man. He doesn't uh, take crap from anyone. Uh, and, and tells it as it is. Who is this guy? I got to look it up. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. All right, so Dan Pina. Okay, let's go to Dan. Who is this dude? Mexican-American uh, businessman. Huh. I, I've, I've never heard. Oh, he was an analyst on Wall Street. Okay, then he went to, to make money in oil in Texas and his company got listed on the market. Uh, okay, huh, I, I've never heard of him. Interesting. Um, and he wrote here, GOAT, on his own website. <laughs> I can't write it on my website. I can't write GOAT, which means uh, the greatest of all time. Oh my God, who is this guy? Oh, this, is, this is awesome. Wow. Okay. The QLA Godfather. I've never heard of this guy before. Trillion dollar man. Is, he's not a trillionaire though. No one's a trillionaire. Wow. Well, a lot, a lot of self-promotion. But what I will say is if, if, if you don't promote yourself um, and you can do it tactfully, then nobody will know. You, you have to remind people of your accomplishments. And a lot of people do it uh, by, have, by stating that other people have said good things about them. For example, on your LinkedIn profile, you need to get at least five or 10 people to write LinkedIn recommendations for you. Uh, and you need to be able to brag in interviews as well. I teach you how to do that in more detail in my MBA program. Um, you can brag by prefacing something with, I'm humbled to say uh, that I was awarded whatever. Yeah, yeah. This looks like a guy I don't, I don't wanna mess with, man. He looks like uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Uh, playing Gordon Gecko, <laughs> as as produced and written by, uh, 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 yeah, I'm not going to go there. All right. Thank you for for telling me about this person, though. I will look into that. Though it's interesting. 
Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, it looks like he, he his website was created by Francis Ford uh, Coppola. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Dello wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Uh, what is your uh, take on decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs? Uh, will, will they be the main form of companies uh, in the future or are they uh, more uh, more niche? So I'm a... I'm a big believer in automation uh, and I'm a big believer in having hardly any employees. I'm a big believer in using technology to replace mundane repetitive tasks. I'm a big believer in cloud computing. I'm a big believer in making online courses and online products where it's infinitely scalable. So I am a fan of this industry a uh, longer term. I'm a huge fan of automation as well. Okay, uh, next up, uh, the Berlin, who's in my MBA program, wrote, uh, Chris, when calculating the price earnings multiple, uh, do we use the closing price uh, all the time? Yeah, always use the most recent price uh, for the numerator. The denominator, it's up to you. For me, I like my denominators, my EPS. I like to actually be my earnings estimate in five or 10 years because it doesn't matter what earnings are today. What matters is your future expectations. And if you think long term as well, uh, when creating your, your, your EPS multiple, meaning five or 10 years out, then you can kind of ignore volatility in the stock. And you could tell yourself, I know the path. No, I know the destination, but I don't know the path. Because all we care about is this anyway, the destination. Okay. Uh, and Manas wrote, thanks for everything. Uh, God bless you all forever. Thank you. You wrote, see you next week and forever. Thank you for all those wonderful emojis. Uh, and then you wrote, uh, by the way, maybe I'm one of those uh, people uh, who's been present maybe every day. It's cool. I love the Haroon Education Ventures family. Thank you. And it's always great to have you. Uh, and I purchased your book uh, that you wrote a year and a half ago uh, called Bonds Before Business, which is great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to, to Ahmed, who wrote, many people out there claim that we should get rid of our holding of cash and convert it into silver or gold. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so cash has always been uh, an awful investment. Cash is trash, uh, unless it's like a nuclear winner. Um, it's always important to have some cash just in case. Uh, but the problem with cash is that, and governments have been doing this since the beginning of time, Governments will print too much cash, which is not fair for us. You know, we work so hard to make our money and someone's diluting it. Like the U.S. government, uh, they increased the amount of cash out there by 40 percent in the past two years. They kind of had to, given, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures with COVID. But governments have been doing this since the beginning of time. And the reason that the Roman Empire fell was because they printed too much currency. So I would always try to have a little bit of cash just in case, right? but I would try to always put it into investments where there's a dearth of supply. So a limited supply, meaning certain cryptocurrencies where supply is limited after doing your own research, uh, as well as um, investing in commodities, you know, where, where there's a dearth of supply. My grandfather used to tell me, Chris, buy land, they're not making any more. Yeah, the problem with cash is there's an unlimited amount of supply. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to uh, Harsh wrote, uh, the USA and NATO uh, gave uh, uh, the Ukraine fake promises. Not a single country who is against the West uh, will, will, will tolerate tolerate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's why there's been a ton of, um, of of economic sanctions. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot, a lot of Russians. It, it's unfair. Because a lot of Russians are, don't agree with Putin. Um, and when they try to protest, they're put in jail. Um, and it's not fair. And interest rates last Monday, I'm sure you saw, in Russia for the ruble, uh, went from 9.5% to 20% overnight. I think that was done this past Monday. Terrifying. And so they're trying to make people not take money out of the bank. They're actually not allowing people to send money overseas or to buy U.S. dollars either. And there's been a run on a lot of banks uh, as well uh, in Russia. You know, we, we, had, we have hundreds of people lining up at banks to take their money out. And even as somebody mentioned earlier in this call, the Chinese government and Chinese banks are starting to take money out of Russia as, as well. And that's a great sign that it shows that you know, Russia is not over supporting, getting over supported uh, by, by China, so to speak. And I remember back in uh, 2008, 
when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working. Some people were taking all their money out of their banks. My mom called me. She was in Florida with my dad and she said, honey, should we take all of our money out of Bank of America? And I said, no, no, the US government is not gonna allow that bank to fail. But what a lot of corrupt hedge funds did uh, in 2008 was they hired actors to line up at banks, mid cap banks in New York City. And those hedge funds were short those banks, which is highly illegal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and then Manas uh, is voiced an opinion uh, about uh, Dan Pena uh, saying, uh, never search anything about him. Uh, uh, he is completely the opposite of, of who you are, uh, meaning he's very wealthy and he's good looking. Yeah. Uh, uh, please stay away from that old man. Please, please. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. But he's the godfather, man. I'm scared. He'll give me an offer I can't understand. Okay. Uh, next one, uh, ALB wrote, um, how do you hedge your positions with put options? Yeah. So what you can do, and I teach this in the fourth semester of my, my MBA program, you can find out more at haroonventures.com. What I do is, if I have a concentrated position in a stock, Okay. I gotta, I'll, I'll, let me reuse an example here. Let's say I own Coca-Cola, ticker KO. And let's say I bought that stock 50 years ago, like Warren Buffett did. And let's say that right now I've made so much money on it and I don't want to sell it yet because if I sell it, I'll have to pay a lot of taxes. But let's say I'm worried that Coca-Cola stock is going to pull back a lot in the next six months. I'm terrified. It's a conundrum. If I sell, I pay a lot of taxes and I don't want to sell. So what you can do to hedge your bets is you can buy a put on Coca-Cola and you can, you can make the put size big enough and affordable enough that if Coca-Cola stock drops within six months, I'm perfectly protected. Okay. Um, and the most I can lose is this amount I spent on the put. And a lot of hedge funds do this as well um, at the end of a quarter because they own massive positions in companies that they bought in an IPO. And they don't want the investment bankers to find out they sold that IPO. So what these hedge funds do is they'll own the company, and, but they'll buy massive puts to offset the fact that, um, or they'll, they'll yeah, uh, it offset the fact that they don't believe in the company as much. And what some hedge funds do uh, in order to let big companies know they're big shareholders um, is for certain strategic reasons. They'll buy a big stake in a company right at the end of a quarter, and they'll buy a put as well to be able to kind of, in case the stock drops, but they'll still get to show management team uh, or the management team of the company they invested in and, uh, and the competition of their hedge funds, the fact they own the stock. Okay. And by law, um, uh, hedge funds that manage over $100 million, they have to disclose on a quarterly basis what they own, stock-wise, not puts. Okay. Okay, the next question is, how do you finance uh, Web 3.0? Yeah, so Web 1.0 uh, was uh, Internet 1.0 in the 90s, uh, where it was just static web pages with banner ads. Web 2.0 was everything up until now, which means, you know, apps and more dynamic stuff. Web 3.0 is going to be VR based. In terms of financing it, the easiest way to do it is to use open source platforms that already exist. I've looked at a ton of them. I've done a ton of research on it. Uh, I might be using a spatial.io, which is three or four weeks ago when I held that webcast and we just did a, a pretend early beta or early alpha demo of what uh, Web 3.0 is gonna look like when I deploy it in my university. That was using spatial.io, yeah. Next question is from Eric who wrote, uh, LegalZoom is a great suggestion, awesome. And I'm not sponsored by anybody, nor will I ever be. Does it hurt my YouTube growth big time? Do I care? No. I'm always putting my student first, always. The second I start taking endorsements from, from companies like Microsoft or whatever it is uh, to, to partner with, is I'm putting them first and you second. Um, and I couldn't disclose this, but two years ago, I was in discussions with Forbes magazine uh, to make the Haroon Education Ventures MBA, the Forbes Haroon Education Ventures MBA degree program. Thank God we didn't go through with that, yeah. So LegalZoom is a great suggestion. Also, I thought of a process improvement uh, while I was working at, at that company. I was reluctant to share it with them. Maybe I'll start my own company and implement it. Yeah, absolutely, 
Absolutely. And, and given that, that knee injury you mentioned, again, if you were hurt on the job, um, legal zoom will, they'll have better advice than I do. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and then, uh, the Berlin who's in my MBA program wrote, Chris on the peg ratio exercise, it was 1.04. Uh, you said it's a ratio of less than one by and it's over two. It's a short, but what about in between? Yeah. And that's just generally speaking. So for those of you not familiar with what a peg ratio is, a peg ratio basically will take a price earnings ratio and put it into context and tell you if it makes sense or not based on the growth of earnings. So for example, the average return on the S&P 500, or I should say the average valuation on the S&P 500 stocks is about 15 times, roughly, roughly. And the average uh, company in the S&P 500 has earnings growing at 15%, okay? Roughly over the long run. And so the price earnings ratio of the average company in the S&P 500 historically is 15 times. What does that mean? Well, that means on the numerator, you've got uh, price, on the denominator, you've got earnings. Always think of the denominator for everything for the rest of your life as number one. So price over earnings. So at, at 15 times earnings, that means the average stock in the S&P 500 historically, for every $1 in earnings they have, investors are willing to pay $15. Now, if the average company in the S&P 500 trades at 15 times earnings historically, and the average company in the S&P 500 has earnings growth of 15%, then 15 PE over 15 is one. Now, if a company is growing slower than the S&P, let's say it's growing at 10 times earnings, it should trade at 10 times, uh, uh, it, at least if it's growing at 10%, it should trade at 10 times its earnings growth rate, okay? Which means a peg of one. Price earnings of 10 divided by 10% growth is one. If a company in the S&P is growing earnings at 20%, which is faster than the average S&P company, then it should trade at at least 20 times earnings, which is 20 times its, its growth rate. So this is how it works. And so I like to look at peg ratios uh, longer term. And if a company is trading at a really high nosebleed peg level, meaning a price to earnings divided by growth of over two, sometimes I'll think about shorting it. What does that mean? Well, let's say that, that a company uh, in the S&P 500 is trading at 15 times earnings, but its earnings growth rate is only 7.5%. So a 15 times earnings divided by 7.5 is two. It's too expensive. So anything with a peg above two, a lot of hedge funds think about screening and sh looking into shorting them. And anything with a peg below one, a lot of people like to look to buy the company as long as there's no material, material issues with the company. Yeah. And that's why it's interesting because Whenever a company reports earnings and it gaps down or gaps up after the market closes, it's usually because the earnings growth rate has been impacted by the amount it moves. Let me explain what that means in detail. If a company reports earnings and they miss earnings by 10%, then the stock drops by 10%, usually on average. If a, stock, if a company reports earnings and they beat by 20%, then what happens is the stock goes up by 20%, right? And that, that's very, very rough uh, baseline to use. Of course, there's a lot of other factors at work, like was a miss or a beat already priced in, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Erop wrote, uh, hello from the U Ukraine. God, God bless you. I, I hope you're doing well. Um, and if you want, I can open up Zoom and we could have a discussion right now. Um, or I can just pray for you, which, which I do every night. Everybody in Ukraine. Yeah. And I hope your family is safe. Yeah. And I'm sorry what, what you're going through as well. And I love your president for standing up the way he does. Yeah. All right. Uh, and, and an Erop from Ukraine wrote, uh, uh, thanks uh, for your content. I, I love your videos and Udemy courses. Thank you and God bless you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Erop, send me a message um, over LinkedIn if you want. I'll give you my MBA program for free, um, including one-on-one -on -one help and all that stuff. Um, actually, email support at haroonventures.com. Yeah, and we'll set up a, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, 
Okay, next up, the Berlin wrote, Chris, uh, on PEG, meaning price earnings to growth, where we pick up the growth rate from? Yeah, so you can look at earnings growth uh, for the company based on your income statement estimates from this year versus last year. And we, we're talking about this in our class as well. So uh, the Berlin is in my, uh, my gold program, I think. Uh, and so we're gonna be discussing this in FA18 on Monday. Yeah, that's finance and accounting semester one, class number eight, yeah. Okay, Rose, who graduated from my MBA program two years ago. Good to see you, Rose is from the great state of Virginia uh, and a happy Ash Wednesday in hindsight to you as, as well. Um, you wrote, any update on the Rwanda project? Has construction begun or still uh, in the planning phases? Yeah, so we, we put up the solar on the church, which basically is powering the entire school. Uh, we took the first dig as well. Um, we're working as fast as we can on it. It's taken a while. And at, for a while there, we were getting too aggressive with, with our, our planning for it. We kept adding more buildings to it. Uh, and I was joking with Vital that if, if I keep this up, we're gonna try to build the, uh, the Burj Khalifa, <laughs> big building uh, in the middle of, um, uh, in, in Magoo, Rwanda. Yeah, we're making progress though, yeah. yeah. And with, with, uh, with COVID, there's been some roadblocks, et cetera, but we'll, we'll get it done, yeah. But I'll be honest. If I were a quota carrying sales rep, I'd probably be fired over and over again because I'm much too optimistic. And Mark Benioff once said, we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in a year and we massively underestimate what we can accomplish in a decade. It's gonna happen though, yeah. Okay, and as Jim Cameron, the great Canadian director, writer, producer of Avatar uh, and Titanic, he once said, if you set your expectations really high and you fail, you still fail above everyone else's expectations. Yeah. I'll probably fail no matter what. But I'll have fun doing it. Okay. Uh, next up, Eric uh, uh, wrote, uh, speaking of business leaders uh, who, who've inspired me, Howard Hughes, who's the modern day Elon Musk. And there's a great movie about uh, called The Aviator you guys should check out. Leonardo DiCaprio is in it. And he plays Howard Hughes, who is the modern day uh, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, so you wrote, um, Howard Hughes inspired me the most. Elon Musk is second. Uh, I, I kind of think uh, the way they think uh, being technically minded, creative uh, and innovative. Yeah, it's fascinating. And watch that movie with, with Leo. He gives a, a, a magnificent per performance. You learn about history as well. Uh, but Howard Hughes was, was very troubled uh, in, in the end. Um, but God, he was brilliant. Yeah, and I, I respect him too. Yeah, and Boeing, okay. uh, Boeing owns this company now through Hughes. I think they bought it years ago, yeah. Okay. The Financial Advisor Show, good to see you. Uh, hello, everyone. Chris, what are your thoughts on core satellite investing uh, strategy? Yeah, so whenever I look at a new market, I always ask myself this basic question before doing research. In five years, will this industry be more relevant or less relevant than it is today? And so with satellites, certainly much more relevant, much more relevant. So I'm bullish longer term. The issue is though that it's very CapEx intensive, the industry, and it's very much reliant on one major customer, which is the United States government, if you're investing in the United States. But I'm very bullish on Starlink, which is part of SpaceX. And uh, Elon Musk has said he's gonna spin that off into a publicly traded company. And I can't wait to look at the financials uh, to see you know, what, what the growth rate is. They've got, I think a couple thousand low orbiting satellites right now. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this web class, they moved a lot of those low orbiting satellites over top of the Ukraine to offer free internet uh, uh, service. And all the Russians can do is wave their fist in the sky. I love Elon Musk and go Ukraine. Okay, the whole world is Pulling for Ukraine. All right. Um, uh, moving on to Eric uh, with a question on uh, on data and analysis. Do you recommend learning game theory, A/B testing, etc.? Uh, what else do you recommend? Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to data uh, analysis, um, what I would do is I would start off just to see if you're passionate about it. I would start off in Excel and just play around with Excel play with the filter features, then the pivot tables. Um, and then uh, there are other plugins you can throw into as well, power data plugins. Then I play around with macros, which is visual basic for applications and play around with the data there. And if you enjoy it, then as a next step, 
I would look at other more sophisticated products like Tableau, which is owned now by Salesforce.com. Uh, and I play around with, with learning Python as well. You can learn it from Angela Yu uh, on Udemy. She's wonderful. She's amazing. Um, yeah, but make sure you're passionate about the sector in, in general. Yeah, you, you have to thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, of A-B testing, it's not very hard to, to learn. Um, usually A-B testing, for those you're not familiar with, it means you test two paths, A and B. What's a better path? And so a lot of us, uh, when it comes to social media, when it comes to titles uh, of, of our, our emails, and for those of you that get, get emails from me, what we've been doing is we send out two versions of that email with different subject lines. We're A-B testing it as well. Yeah. Okay. Game theory, yeah, I don't think you have to really learn game theory. Um, it's, it's not really hard. Game theory is basically, uh, instead of thinking one move ahead in chess, you think multiple moves ahead, like Kasparov used to. Uh, and I'm sure Putin has thought through this sort of uh, when it came to the economic impact uh, on his country of attacking Ukraine and what the West would do. And he underestimated the West, yeah. Okay. Um, and Anurag said, Chris, uh, any trips planned uh, for this year? Uh, hope to see you uh, in India soon. Thank you. Um, we were thinking of going to, um, uh, to Istanbul. Um, I'd love to go to Istanbul. Turkey is a beautiful country. Um, we don't know anymore yet, uh, but we thought about this summer. Um, my, uh, uh, my, my partner here, my company, uh, Matt Lacuse, um, his, um, his best friend is flying to Poland uh, and then the Ukraine to do a, a relief mission. And, and Matt might be going as well. He texted me about it the other day. God bless him. Yeah. I'd love to visit India again. And I will. Yeah. And eventually we'll do our annual alumni events from different countries. It'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, Supersonic wrote, uh, hello, sir, Chris, please. Uh, I'm from India, and I've already uh, pursued uh, your courses on Udemy. Thank you. I appreciate it. My, my second biggest market is, is India. Yeah, thanks. Fred Mendoza, great to see you. So Fred graduated from my MBA program last year. Great guy. He's from Baltimore. Um, he uh, works in the healthcare sector, and he's a rock star real estate investor as well on the side. Uh, he's excellent when it comes to options, and he actually was my, my beta test candidate with my option stuff before I released it last year. Fred, it's always a pleasure to see you, and thank you so much for that video you shared at our graduation that showed you in front of the Lincoln Memorial uh, uh, saying nice things to me and stuff. And that picture you sent with you with a rock. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. God bless you. I miss you. Okay. Give me one second, guys, here. Okay, Rose has a question, which is, can you explain more about how uh, FIFA uh, places ads? Uh, you're saying they blend it in uh, with the virtual uh, environment uh, so that it doesn't feel like an ad, but then what is that? Me what measure do they use for ad effectiveness? Yeah, uh, and this is something that, that Bobby Kotick, who's the, I guess the former CEO, soon to be leaving Activision, something he pioneered, uh, in-game ads. Um, I think around 2010, they started looking at this, this sort of thing. So it, it's basically, it's like when you're watching a televised sporting event, right? And, and you see these ads, <laughs> I'll show you here. So let's go to FIFA game and I'll show you just an image, yeah. So all this means, and, and many people play FIFA on this webcast, is right here on the sides. You see these purple things here? These are all ads, okay? And uh, when we watch televised sports, uh, there's an Israeli uh, defense company actually that came up with a technology so that we think those ads are really there, but they're actually just like green screen overlays, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and so this is a, a big uh, microtransaction or, or I should say uh, advertising revenue stream for, for Activision uh, as well as EA that makes this, this game and others as well. And in the metaverse, um, uh, in, in the metaverse, I think you're going to see more ads like this as well um, on walls and stuff. Yeah, I'm getting shiny here. So whenever you guys do these webcasts, this, this seems out there, but to get rid of the shine, you get stuff like this from a place called Sepahora. My wife got me this and it get, gets rid of the shine. But anybody in movies ha has this on them as well. And there's usually a makeup person. And, and when I did my, um, my, my trailers for my courses, uh, when I went to uh, the Czech Republic a couple times, um, I had, um, there was a woman that did, uh, 
Desperate Housewives, the show. She was a makeup artist. She came in. I don't know anything about makeup, but I'm not shiny anymore, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, next next question uh, is from uh, the Berlin, uh, who wrote. Um, and give me one second. Let me check the time because last week I went on too long. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes left, and then I got to jump off to do the um, the silver on demand MBA uh, office hours. We can use Zoom there as well if, if you guys from Silver want to join. Yeah, and for those of you in the Silver MBA program, you can always go to the first lecture uh, of your MBA program to see this week's link uh, for the weekly office hours for you guys. Okay, next up, uh, the Berlin wrote, uh, Chris, when we did the, the future value equation of, of uh, you wrote here, 10 times 1.2 to the power of two, that means if you have $10 today and you think the interest rate's gonna be 20% for the next two years, uh, then uh, the math to what that amount's gonna be in two years is 10 times 1.2 to the power of two. So when we did the future value equation of 10 times 1.2 to the power of time, which is two, the period in between one uh, and the interest rate symbolizes the percent and if yes, how does Excel recognize the sum of one plus the interest rate? Uh, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, let's, let's go to Excel held together uh, and, and we'll run through that. Let's go to EXC. So Excel has a lot of great built-in functions to do this stuff for you uh, automatically, but, uh, but I'll show you. Okay, so the, the question from the Berlin is, how does the math work? Okay, so if you have $100 today, okay, uh, and, and that the present value is $100. What is the future value of, of $100 uh, in, in one year, okay, at a given interest rate? So here's what I'm gonna do. Down here, I'm gonna put um, interest rate, okay? And uh, right here, I'll enter in the number. So let me first go 0 0.2, 20%, okay? Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use named uh, name ranges here. So this makes much more sense for us. So I'm going to highlight here, and I'm going to call this interest rate. Okay, good. Okay, so the, if I have $100, okay, that's the present value. What is the future value going to be at an interest rate of 20%? And let me name this here, present value, okay? Okay, good. So the math is as follows. Equals present value, okay? times one plus the interest rate, interest rate, okay, to the power of one, okay? So in one year, it, 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 100 bucks is worth 120 bucks at an interest rate of 20%. Let's add more logic to this though, more, more layers. Let's add time here, okay? So time here is one year and we'll change this around. So right here, the way to get the, the future value uh, is uh, you take the present value times one plus the interest rate to the power of time, okay? Whoops, did I get that right? Oh, I forgot to name it, hold on a second. I'll go here and I'll call it time x because time might be a reserve word, okay? So to the power of time x. <laughs> time x, give me one second, guys, sorry. Right here, here we go. Yay, it works. Okay, cool. So the, the, the future value of 100 bucks in one year, okay, at an interest rate of, of 20% is equal to this, okay? If we change it to two years, watch what happens on the right. Obviously, the number will go up. So in two years, it's $144. Now, if you rearrange this equation here, future value equals all this stuff. If you rearrange it with present value equals a bunch of other stuff, then you can solve for the present value. Just rearrange the formula. Okay. So in Excel, there's there's a better way to do this though. Okay. So in Excel, what you can do is you can calculate the value of earnings you're going to make over a number of years with one simple calculation as follows. So let's pretend it's year 2022 now. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll drag this out five years. Yeah. Okay, so these here are years, okay? Uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put down here money made. So let's say we make 100 bucks this year, 150 next year, 200 the year after, 50 the year after, and 500 there, okay? Whoops, it's a little bit too much. All right, so there's something called the net present value. 
And so Excel has a calculation that will calculate what all that money we're making in the future should be worth today. And here's how you do it. You enter in NPV, which is net present value. You open brackets and right there, Excel says, hey, what's the rate? So let's say it's, um, I don't know, 20%, okay? Then <clears throat> you do comma and Excel is saying, hey, what are the values? So you highlight the values here and then you hit enter. And lo and behold, the value of all these cash flows here or these earnings here, the money you're making in today's term at an interest rate of 20% is that much money. Now, if I, highlight, if, if I show you the sum of these without discounting, it's a lot higher because we're not including the interest rate. So the sum is a thousand bucks of all that stuff. So if there's no interest rate, say the interest rate is zero, okay, then the present value is a thousand bucks. But if the interest rate is say, I don't know, 2%, then the present value of these future cash flow streams is $929. And if that sounds complicated, the best way to think about it is to start with first calculating the future value and then reverse engineer it and solve for the present value. And that will make a lot more sense. And if you have additional questions about that, uh, please let me know and thank you. Okay. Moving on to Eric, uh, who wrote, um, uh, Coach Red Pill on YouTube is married to a Ukrainian woman. He is over there right now and is giving great commentary about what is really happening that you'll never hear in the news. Yeah, and I've, been, I've actually been seeing a lot of news um, uh, on, on, on the war and the younger generation as well, my kids, uh, on TikTok, where a lot of people are live broadcasting it as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, the Berlin wrote, uh, Chris, uh, Joe Biden uh, announced that Intel, this, com this company here, we do a case study in Intel, my MBA class, that's why I have this. Uh, so uh, Biden announced that Intel will build a massive chip plant here in the United States. What will be the outcome uh, with competition, work demand and prices since they're still uh, made here? Uh, will, be, will it be expensive? And what are the pros and cons? Yeah, yeah. So um, usually big companies like Intel uh, and, and big car companies that open massive factories or fabs as they call them to make chips. Usually what they do is they build these massive fabs, these expensive plants in areas of the world where taxes are low. And so, for example, in Ireland, where corporate tax is only 11.5%, there's a ton of tech companies that produce stuff there. And a lot of baseball cards I bought when I was a kid, the Tiffany edition of Topps cards were, were made in Ireland as well. So it's all about tax incentives. So I'm sure that Biden is providing generous tax incentives to wherever Intel is going to be building that plant. Um, and the pros and cons, I mean, the pros are, I guess, jobs uh, in the country where, where Biden resides, uh, uh, leads. Um, I don't know much about the cons, what they would be. As long as they're getting enough of a tax break it, and it makes business sense for them to do, uh, I'm sure that there really aren't that many cons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Hari wrote, uh, Chris, uh, uh, being your MBA student, thank you. I completed uh, with my book titled 51 Things Every Mechanical Engineer Should Know. Can you please uh, give it a forward? If so, um, how can I uh, send the materials to you? Yeah. So if, if, you're, in my, um, if you're in my silver uh, MBA program, meaning the on-demand one, the $999 one, uh, ask me that question uh, in about 10 minutes uh, on our silver call. Okay. If you're in my gold or platinum program, ask me on our weekly for gold and platinum MBA students office hours today, starting at 1120. Thanks. Okay, next up we have uh, Peter, who is uh, 19 years old from Romania. How are you? He's a big soccer fan. Uh, so Peter wrote, uh, uh, hey Chris, in Obama's book, A Promised Land, uh, which, which I, I listened to, it's great. I didn't vote for Obama, but I, I love him. Uh, now, I recommend listening to the audible version of that book because Obama actually narrates it and you can learn a lot about public speaking just by listening to him, actually. Yeah. It's 30 hours long, I finished it last year, it was great. You wrote, in Obama's book, A Promised Land, which is part one, he's making part two soon too. He says that he created a family with his volunteers and other campaign helpers. I wanna ask you, uh, how can we build a family when creating a business and not a team? Uh, thanks a lot and have a great day. Thank you, yeah. So when you start a company, 
the corporate culture is usually set by the founder. The founder's personality and the way they manage usually sets a tone for the entire culture of the entire company. Now, when you start a company, what I recommend doing is thinking about your, your core values and your mission statement and your vision statement. For example, when I worked at Goldman Sachs, they, they had us all read their 14 business principles. And I'm gonna show this to you really quickly. I won't bore you with all the details, but I think it's important to understand from a corporate culture perspective, what your company stands for. So I'll do a search for Goldman 14, it'll correct me. Yeah, all, oh, here we go. Goldman 14 business principles. Okay, so everything the company stands for is in these 14 principles here. That was from one of their earlier uh, analyst reports in, or uh, annual reports in the 1970s. So here, our clients always come first, interest, okay? Our assets are our people. Profits are key to success. Um, there's one here about ethics as well. Here we go, integrity and honesty are at the heart of our, our business. We stress teamwork in everything we do. So if you're to interview at Goldman Sachs or a company that has principles listed on their website, you definitely wanna mention these strength words like, like teamwork, uh, integrity, honesty, all that stuff as well. And I think it's actually a, a good soft skill exercise to do, meaning to come up uh, with uh, your corporate culture. And it's something I'm working on right now uh, through a course called the Complete Leadership Course, which I'll be publishing uh, by April at the latest uh, with Jimmy Norain, uh, who's probably one of the world's best public speakers and confidence, confidence gurus. Yeah, he's a good guy, he inspires me. And I'll interview Jimmy actually on this webcast in a couple of weeks. Okay. Okay, um, uh, and Eric wrote, uh, uh, Dan Pena is called uh, the trillion, trillion dollar man because that is how much wealth uh, it is claimed uh, his mentees uh, created. Okay, cool. Uh, a trillion dollars is not as much as it used to be. <laughs> no, it's a lot. Cool, thank you. Moving on to a question from the Berlin uh, who wrote, uh, Chris, uh, since you said we should never, since you said we should move away from old school resources and more into battery companies, is that more like uh, in the clean energy space, like companies uh, like Ticker uh, Plug, I believe? Yeah, I, I'm not too familiar with that company right now. Um, but I, I, I guarantee you that the whole world is gonna really gonna be focusing uh, on, on clean tech and take it to the next level, given what's happened in Russia. And as I mentioned earlier, once many years ago, uh, a very famous Saudi oil investor from Saudi Aramco said, the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. And so uh, Russia trying to flex its military muscles because of its, its control of commodities is shooting themselves in the foot longer term. Yeah, and I can't wait until we're no longer dependent on oil. Yeah. Okay, and uh, next up we have Sarah who wrote, uh, thank you, Chris, you're most welcome. I spent almost $4,000 in an entrepreneurship program uh, that's not transparent. And I did not learn how to sell or communicate. I got stuck, stuck after generating leads. I wish I'd uh, known you earlier. Thank you. And then you wrote, I'm, I'm learning so much from your live class uh, and online classes to improve my life. God bless. Awesome. Great to hear. Thank you. And if you want, you can, there's, look, you can take my entire MBA program and get your money back. You can watch it in 30 days and get your money back if you want to as well. Just go to my website to learn more about the MBA program. And I also have a, a special on, which is nine courses uh, for, for 49 bucks. And I have a subscription service I'm just releasing and a 99 cent six hour course of mine I just released here. Okay. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Naman wrote, uh, how do you plan a career path uh, and choose it? Yeah. So before you think about um, what career you want, uh, and how to get that job. Before you figure out how to do it, I want you to think about why. Why do I want that career? If it's only to amass a fortune, then it won't work out for you. It's gotta be something, when you ask yourself, why do I want it? It's gotta be something you're passionate about. And so whatever it is your passion is, that's what I say you pursue in your career, no matter what anybody tells you. Because if you do what you're passionate about and you chase your dreams and you don't give a damn what other people think, something wonderful happens. Your dreams come true and you make money, a lot of money, accidentally. It's what happens with all entrepreneurs. Elon Musk never did all this stuff to make money. He's passionate about putting his dent in the universe, literally. 
So if you chase money, you lose your dreams and your money. But if you pick a career that you're passionate about by chasing your dreams and again, fail a bunch of times and don't care what people think, then you will live your life in your own terms because you only have to be right in business one time. Okay, we got to wrap this up in a minute, guys. Okay, next question is from uh, JTF, uh, who wrote, uh, I work at TD, which is Toronto Dominion, in the IT services desk, okay? And uh, in a, in a, in, you probably work in Commerce Court West uh, in Toronto, okay? Uh, and a big focus is, is automation. Uh, I wanted to set myself apart by identifying uh, additional automation opportunities in advice for th finding things to automate. Yeah, yeah. So everything I do, uh, like on my website, is is automated, right? So, you know, if 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 you come to my website and you you download this book, for example, it's automated. I, I have code running in the background, APIs that talk to uh, Active Campaign, where I, I manage my my email system. Um, I also have um, all my courses uh, automated as well, to the extent that. Whenever you buy any of my courses, okay, any of my courses, uh, what you what happens is it's automated so that uh, I put you on a certain list. You can always unsubscribe, uh, and you get emails over time. So you 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 get a bunch of emails over time. I have automation set up for all this stuff. My entire business is automation based. All all this this tech stuff here that you think looks I don't know kind of interesting and harder to code and stuff. It's all automation. And it's all based on me using other people's assets and licensing them. So there's uh, all this stuff on my website. I think it's Elf. It's called Elf Site Apps. And, and I recommend, I got to wrap this up in a second. Sorry, guys. Uh, but, but I recommend you guys check out this, this company here. Okay, so all the stuff I have on my website, all the cool stuff is done through something I paid 10 bucks per month for uh, right, right here. Right, so all, all the banners, buttons, everything uh, uh, is, is, is right here. Um, so, so check it out. Um, I want to show this to you because I think this is really helpful. So for example, um, the testimonial slider and, and the pricing table for my, my MBA. It's all done here. And all you do is you copy one line of code and paste it directly onto your website. You just do a code injection. Very easy JavaScript uh, insert. Easy to do. And so all this stuff here is, is automatically created uh, right here. And, and so uh, what you do is you go add to website, you click this button here, and all you do is copy and paste this script here uh, um, uh, on, on your website. Really, really easy to do. I'm happy to go through that in more detail next week if you want. Uh, I see there's a, a ton more questions here. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get to them. Uh, please join us again next week to ask me those questions. Or if you're in my Silver MBA program, uh, I'll see you uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we're going to start uh, the, the Silver MBA call, uh, meaning the on-demand call. Uh, for students that pay $9.99 for, for the uh, the silver version of the MBA degree program. Uh, we'll do Zoom as well if you want. Uh, I'll look through your LinkedIn profile, I'll help you with that. Uh, and what I can also do if you want is go through your business plan, um, mock interview you, et cetera, um, and take care. Uh, if this was helpful, please click like and, and the subscribe button. Uh, God bless you all. Stay safe. Uh, and I'll see you all next week. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.